What's up, everybody? It's Jason Cruz here once again with another episode of The Legal Submission. And this time we take a look at the UFC antitrust lawsuits and the last filing from last week, which relates to a motion for preliminary approval of the settlement. You may recall we, we as well as everyone else, reported that the U UFC had settled with both the plaintiffs in the Kung Lui lawsuit and the Cajun Johnson lawsuit for a total of $335 million. And that ended the, the case, which was set to go to trial actually in April. Uh, the motion for preliminary approval of the settlement will go to Judge Bulware for the, uh, on behalf uh, of the court. He will evaluate the settlement plans which have been uh, hammered out by both sides from Zufa and the attorneys for the fighters. And the judge would have to make sure and ensure that it's fair for the plaintiffs in this case and go ahead and sign off on it. So the motion for preliminary approval of the settlement is a document which requests that Judge Bulwark go ahead and and uh, sign off on the settlement plans and the plan of allocation. So attached uh, to the motion are, is the plan of allocation as well as several declarations, including from one from plaintiff's uh, expert Hal Singer, which relates to the fairness of the settlement and the uniqueness of the case. So from one perspective, this case is one of, is uh, arguably the biggest lawsuit in sports history in which uh, the plaintiff side, uh, labor side uh, of the uh, of the of a dispute of a labor dispute uh, received compensation from employee side the uh, the the employee force here in this in this case the UFC obviously it's independent contractor and uh, contractor but uh, you get the point and so uh, to break it down for you first of all the attorneys on behalf of Lee and and Cage and Johnson are requesting one third of the settlement fund, the settlement fund being the $335 million and reimbursement of litigation expenses of no more than $11 million. So right off the top, they are asking for $10 million in attorney's fees as well as $11 million in litigation expenses. Now, litigation expenses include court fees, paying for the experts, filing fees, if you need a hotel room, if you need airfare, if you need a, a, a videographer, if you need a, a, a court reporter, things of those nature. That is goes into litigation expenses. Obviously, over 10 years, I mean, almost over 10 years of time, those things add up and in th this type of case where there's big money uh big money uh and big uh big uh business issues at stake 11 million dollars is not out of the question they will still have to uh prove up all of their expenses meaning they have to show how much they pay their experts they have to ensure that the expert fees are commensurate with the industry that that they work in and uh, they have to ensure that the the uh the costs that they paid uh for hotel room board airfare uh court reporters things of that nature are commensurate with what uh, a reasonable litigation would be in this particular instance so there is that, and the court will have to determine that. And, uh, you know, Zufa could object to some of the litigation expenses, but I doubt there would be any uh, huge fight here at this point in time. Now, from that, Nate Quarry, whose uh, who's law, uh, his legal dispute in this antitrust case was dismissed because the plaintiff decided to do away with the identity claim part of the lawsuit and Quarry's fights were outside the scope of the time frame for the Lee plaintiffs. He received a settlement of $250,000, which is actually very good just considering that he would have probably received nothing if this were a case were to go to trial. Now, uh, the defendants 
also agree to changes to their promotional and ancillary rights agreements for a period of five years. Now this relates to the issues uh, concerning contractual uh, uh, issues with uh, fighters and negotiations with the UFC. Uh, namely, it uh, shortened the time for uh, the rights to match, uh, shortened the time for uh, exclusive ne negotiation, uh, things of that uh, that um, ilk were were amended. However, the clause indicates that this is only going to main be maintained for five years. So as we see here, here are the contractual concessions of Zufa, which will only last five years. Uh, and one might infer that if, if uh, they want to, they could revert back to their old contractual form after five years time, unless something else changes within, within the Ali Act, which would expand it to MMA, or another lawsuit or something, another piece of legislation. Uh, this is only a momentarily amendment to the contracts. So if you were thinking that the lawsuit would bring a uh, change permanently, it probably won't. So uh, in terms of the relief that is being granted for five years at least, any exclusive negotiation period contained in Zufa's promotional and ancillary rights agreements will not exceed 30 days. Right to match uh, following the exclu expiration of the exclu exclusive negotiation period contained in Zufa's agreement will not exceed four months. Zufa will limit an extension of the term of its promotional and ancillary rights agreements in the event a fighter turns down a bout with an opponent Zufa designates to the longer of the length of time sufficient to find a new opponent or for six months. This is kind of the Nathan Diaz issue in which he was uh, being uh, held out due to the fact he wouldn't sign a longer extension. Uh, Zufa will change its practice on how the retirement clause operates to place a maximum of four years to the suspension of the terms of the, their uh, promotional rights agreement while a fighter is retired or disabled or otherwise allow for earlier termination of the agreement. Uh, so this is interesting because uh, just recently, Nick Diaz returned uh, to the, is returning to the octagon after almost four years away uh, from, from his last fight. He last fought in September 2019. He's fighting in Octo uh, at least scheduled to fight in August of 2024 in Abu Dhabi. Um, this might have pertained to Nick, if it not for the fact that I believe he still has fights on his contract. So if he, Nick were to have retired in 2019, you know, uh, it, the retirement clause would not have, would not have related to him. Uh, he would be outside the scope of this retirement clause. Okay, Zufa agrees that UFC fighters retain the right to use their own identities, including, for example, the sale of fighters' names, images, voices, and likenesses by third parties of merchandise. This likely means that if you are a UFC fighter, you can broker a deal with a, uh, an, a third party vendor to utilize your name, image, or likeness. Uh, I think this might be a, one of the better options here for, for the company. Um, we'll talk about that uh, this in a second here. Uh, so the sixth and final one is the Zufa agrees to provide fighters up to three still images of the fighter, the licensing of which will be governed by a license application to and approval by Getty Images. So if you read that, that means Getty Images, who I believe uh, contracts with the UFC to take photos, still owns the copyright to the fighter's photo, which is probably taken in the octagon or training or whatnot. You have Zufa uh, is granting the fighter a license to utilize that um, that uh, photo, that still photo, three images. Uh, whether or not the fighter can utilize that particular image to to uh, you, to contract with a third party 
is a little ambiguous according to these terms. So now getting back to number number five, which relates to the use, UFC's fighters re retains the right to use their own identities. Zufa has indicated in this um, settlement plan that uh, if within the five years time that these con contractual concessions occur, that they determine it's uh, negatively impacting their business, they can go back and uh, file a dispute uh, or request some uh, redress with the arbitrator in this particular case or mediator in this particular case. That's the interesting part because like what happens if a Conor McGregor comes back and since he has use of his own identity and maybe he does already, but maybe he doesn't, assuming he doesn't, if he were to uh, make a ton of money off of his likeness from one of the still images licensed by Zufa, would Zufa come back and say, hey, uh, we need to redo the contracts? It's just something to think about. So as far as the payouts for fighters go, um, the, the, uh, the formula put up uh, allows for fighters to receive a fixed recovery amount of at least five thousand dollars that from the Johnson class. So the jo um, excuse me, let me let me step back. So all the allocation of the Lee and Johnson settlement claims. So in the Johnson case, there they broke it up into two particular classes: ones with arbitration agreements, ones without arbitration agreements. Uh, so with that going into mind, the Johnson arbitration claimants uh, will receive a full fixed recovery, excuse me, a fixed recovery of $5,000 each uh, should a court enforce the arbitration clauses and our class action waivers in the Johnson arbitration claimants contracts with the UFC. These claims will have little practical value. So this was this relates to the fact that um, at some point, the UFC made these fighters sign, re, uh, sign uh, addendum to their contracts, which uh, gave which in, gave them waivers to class action lawsuits like the Lee case. Uh, so they would not uh, if, be a party to a class of uh, uh, to a party or to a class like in Lee. So. A arbitration clause was put into those into those contracts to ensure that if there was ever a dispute, it would go to arbitration and they wouldn't be part of a lawsuit. So those without those without would receive uh, those claimants who were not subject to an arbitration clause or a class action waiver during the Johnson settlement class period would receive. The total compensation each received from UFC for participating in UF bouts and the total number of bouts each fought during the jo Johnson settlement class period. These two pro rata factors will be weighed with 80% of the distribution amount based on the event compensation factor and 20% of the distribution amount based on the number of bouts, fa bouts factor. The allocation process mirrors the one that used in Lee. So there's an 80-20 process which ba is based on the amount you were paid and the total number of bouts that you uh, you participated in the UFC. So the Lee class will be divided based on the number of fights in the UFC and their compensation at the time, which is the sim which is the same thing that I just explained. But the minimum recovery for the Lee, cl Lee claimants is eight thousand dollars. So they get a little more of the the pie there. Uh, for the Lee class, um, yeah, if you recall, the Johnson lawsuit relates to, I believe, 2000, 2020 on, um, while, um, well, 2021, I believe, on, 2021 and on, while Lee relates to 2014 to 2021, I believe. Uh, and so there, there, there is that. So there's an 80 20 split. Uh, event compensation um, and number of bouts uh, fought. So 
Settlements are going to go out with the first going out in November of 2024 and again on April 1, 2025. The settlement funds are going into a trust, I believe. Um, I'm, I believe that the, the trust will, will receive interest uh, and so it will compile. Uh, the plan of allocation includes ways in which they will contact individuals that are part of the, of the, the class. So according to the paperwork, there are approximately 1,140 members of the Lee class and approximately 1,290 members of the Johnson class, with some being members of both. Uh, so there are a lot, almost uh, based on that, there are 1950 fighters across the two classes, less, just less than 2,000 fighters there within the class, and they will be compensated according to the number there, basically their time spent in the UFC and how much they were paid. Um, just some notable observations. Obviously, the contractual concessions, I was surprised with that it's only last five years and still may be challenged at a later date. The minimums of $5,000 for $8,000 for a fighter within the class would seem a little low. However, you would surmise that the Individuals that received five thousand and eight thousand, respectively, are likely the ones that were were barely in the UFC or had just one or two fights in the UFC. And based on the formula devised by the uh, the parties, they don't receive a whole lot as opposed to those who maybe had fifteen twenty fights during the time frame, especially in Lee. And uh, and 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 uh, were put more in than and uh, put more time in in uh, with the UFC than than others. What does this mean? I guess is the is the finality of it. I assume that this will be with minor tweaks. The judge Bullwilber will sign off on this plan of allocation, and they they go forward from there with. Uh, fires being paid out this fall. It was almost 10 years uh, of, of litigation fighting. Unfortunately, COVID really detri det detoured this litigation because of the uh, time spent away and the backlog that the courts had to, had to deal with. And also, Judge Bulware uh, not being able to write that uh, class action uh, order up in in a timely manner that really hurt plaintiffs i believe because if this case were to have have been more condensed and been f five years instead of 10 years you might be, have been able to see a better settlement um but since this has been prolonged it it's it, it's it's hard uh it's hard to justify going to trial with the fat with the knowledge that one you may lose two even if you win, Zufa has indicated that they would go ahead and file an appeal. So how much longer were you going to wait? That's the case. That's the issue. That's something that you, the parties had to think about. Uh, from Zufa's perspective, you know, it, it's, it's a win. It's a win. They, they are still financially profitable. The revenues are up. Sponsorship is up. Uh, they're going to be swimming in a... Uh, Big media rights deal uh, with a lot of options on the table for them to uh, to increase revenue. Um, the relationship with WWE, the TKO, uh, uh, the TKO um, uh, group is is doing well at the time. So three hundred thirty five million dollars is a little blip, but just a minor one. Now, with the contracts yet yet again. Uh, it surprises me that the concessions were only for a limited time with the opportunity to come back and revisit that. Uh, we will see uh, how parties will come back and fight the uh, lack of leverage from, from a fighter's perspective. This, uh, this way, the lawsuit way, uh, is a lengthy process. Certainly, it did um, some good. It did some good, but um, as far as long-term permanent good for the industry of uh, professional mixed martial arts, 
uh, it's questionable. Uh, I think it it shows that fighters are willing to uh, to stand up for their rights, and yet again, it also shows that uh, going up a bit against a bigger corporation with a fleet of lawyers is hard to do. It's hard to do in any industry. So we'll continue on to see how this this uh, settlement goes. I assume it'll, it'll be rubber stamped, but I'll probably have some more thoughts on the contractual concessions in another legal submission. In that, in in the meantime, visit MMA Payout for all the all the ins and outs of the business and legal aspects of MMA, and we will see you next time. Bye bye.